Hi, Harrison. Thanks for joining me, friend. Thank you, my friend. It's nice to be with you. Yes, I've been looking forward to this very much. And uh, just to put this conversation in context for those that are listening, uh, Harrison or Kaishan is my Dharma brother, and we took Bodhisattva vows together in 2018. And uh, he's also the person that inspired me to do metta practice, which has become so much of what seems to be my life's work is practicing that and sharing that with the world. So I have a lot to thank Harrison for and want to learn more about him today by having this conversation. So um, thank you for thank you for speaking with me. Um, oh, yeah. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. And uh, you inspire me too. I, I uh, really enjoy seeing how you manifest love in the world as the love pilgrim. And it's <laughs> you, you got like this really creative way of doing it. Um, and, you know, uh, and some um, sort of uh, similarities to our friend, our uh, inspiration, uh, Peace Pilgrim. Uh, I live on a boat that I named Peace Pilgrim. Mm. And mm, uh, uh, because I, you know, I'm really inspired by uh, her life and her message. And um, I'm inspired by people uh, like you that are, um, you know, kind of adopt that um, pilgrim lifestyle. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, and and so I like uh, seeing you do that. It's inspirational. And then seeing how you also have these other creative ways of manifesting love in the world. And um, so it's very cool and mm -hmm. inspiring to me. Mm, very kind of you, friend. It's a beautiful thing about the path as we get to be inspired and we get to inspire and it's a beautiful feedback loop. So, yeah. Uh, so to begin, I would love to hear from you about the question that I ask everyone, which is just to share your life story and background. And you can share that at whatever length or in whatever way you like. And we'd just love to hear about, you know, your history and who you are and, and what your life has been like. Sure. Um, well, uh, I was born a small child at a very young age. And uh, that's a little <laughs> joke that <laughs> uh, it's not mine. It's a friend of mine, uh, but I, I like it. I still find it amusing. Um, but uh, and I uh, I wasn't very uh, productive at a young age. Um I was an infant, so uh, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't drive or work. Uh, I um, was not what you would call a productive member of society. <laughs> I I was, uh, you could say, an unproductive member of society. <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, didn't contribute to the economy or the GDP, really. <laughs> I uh, the only thing I really produced, you could say, was uh, uh, dirty diapers and maybe a little drool, uh, but also uh, some uh, smiles and uh, love. Mm. Uh, I was a cute, cute baby. Um, so I had that going for me. <laughs> and uh, um. I got older and uh, I remember, and so the way that I was thinking about answering this question is, is kind of maybe through this filter of, you know, Dharma and Metta. And so I was thinking about sort of highlights in my life uh, in, in relation to, to those qualities and aspects and so i thought that maybe i would share that i uh remember um being impressed by uh you know I, my my parents uh uh were religious they went to church um my dad was uh catholic my mom was episcopalian and we ended up going to an Episcopalian church every Sunday. And so um, I remember learning about uh, 
you know, Jesus. And I was really impressed um, by his message of love. And uh, I would say that that contributed to my uh, valuing that, that quality um, and, and hearing about how, you know, you should love your enemies. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, Jesus is really on to something here. That, that is, <laughs> uh, uh, the gold standard. And, you know, I aspired to, to do that. And I sort of felt in deep in my heart. how important that is how desperately needed that is in the world and how i should do my best to align my life uh along those lines and with that value of love and so uh so that was uh i think important in my formative years and then uh, another thing too, I feel like is that was important was that my, well, I loved both my parents and my parents, I felt loved by them. Uh, but my dad had uh, a temper that I was afraid of. And uh, I remember, I, I have a sense that maybe I was around like six years old and uh, um, him, and and sort of thinking at at one point like gosh i really don't want to be like that like not that i didn't want to be like my dad in his entirety because he had a lot of lovely qualities he had a great sense of humor and uh could be very warm and kind and i believe like his you know his his politics and things were coming from a place of of caring and i i think he was he was deep down it was it was he was anxious and, and this anxiety would, uh, manifest in, in, uh, his temper. Uh, so I have, you know, understanding and forgiveness, uh, towards him. But at a young age, I was just like, Whoa, this anger thing is like, I don't like it. And I, I, I don't want to, uh, be like that in the world. I, I don't want to make other people feel bad. Uh, uh, that, that this, the, the way this anger makes me feel. And so what's interesting is that actually when, um, when I was in school, um, so I, you know, I think that might've had some, uh, uh, influence on how I developed and, you know, um, tried to be kind and um you know i like humor and things of that nature and who knows how much of that is just kind of natural uh and but uh also some nurture in there as well maybe an element of that and so um and then there was a period of time in school when i was um uh, I was getting into a lot of fights actually. So in spite of, um, those influences on my life, uh, early on, um, with regard to love, uh, I was almost expelled from, um, uh, let's see, middle school, is it called fourth, fifth, sixth grade, uh, I was going to a school and rooftop and uh, I was getting into a bunch of fights because I sort of like, well, there's a lot of, you know, uh, in schools and with kids, you know, there's sometimes kids can be cruel. And, uh, and I was, 
sometimes there was cruelty directed towards me and sometimes I was cruel to other kids. And, you know, sometimes you're just kind of learning, you've, you've, you're learning how to conduct yourself in the world and experimenting with a lot of different behaviors and attitudes. And, and I remember, um, one time my dad, I, I came home from school and I said, I, I got in a fight and my dad said, uh, good. Or, or he was, he was trying to teach me kind of how to defend myself. I think a lot of parents do that when they hear that their kids are being bullied. And there were times when I was getting bullied, teased and stuff. And, uh, you know, sometimes parents will say, oh, well, you need to fight back. You need to stand up for yourself. And so I really took that to heart and I was getting into all these fights. And then, um, but then I was, I was almost expelled and my parents were one of the schools that they were considering uh, uh, transferring me to was uh, a school down the street called town school It's a private school. The kids wore like ties and jackets. And when we took the, the public uh, bus, the, 24 to visit Darrow, this the kids from rooftop. Uh, we would pass by town school. We would stop there. And the kids from town school would, some of them would get on the bus as well. And we'd make fun of them. Uh, and I, they were, they were kind of, you know, in their private school suits and uh, uniforms. They, they just looked kind of square and uh like nerds and you know and so we would make fun of them and so when i learned that i was might get sent to that school i was like uh oh i better get my act together straighten up and fly right or i'm going to be one of the kids that all the all my friends are are making fun of so uh there was that element and also just kind of a realization that oh okay well yeah this this isn't working. And so uh, I think after that point, I mean, I really became a lot more peaceful uh, and kind. And, and I kind of learned my lesson that, that, that this is not okay to get in fights. And um, so that lesson was learned probably in fifth or sixth grade, uh, right in there. And uh, uh, kind of resolve that problem um and then but uh that anecdote sort of touches on on another sort of step in my uh life um progress along this path which is that uh it that i was very uh insecure i i cared what people thought about me and i wanted to be cool i didn't want to be a square i didn't want to be a nerd and so uh actually in like starting around fifth or sixth grade and 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 certainly into uh uh seventh eighth ninth you know high school like i i wanted to be cool and so uh i started to take an interest in um, alcohol and drugs. You know, I was like, I thought, oh, this, that, that would make me cool and not square. And, and, um, you know, maybe there were some other aspects to my, that choice, but I think that was a lot of it. Now, I, I would also say that maybe there was also sort of, uh, this element of, of like, life is hard, you know, it's stressful. Um, and so there was a aspect of, you know, self-medicating and escapism and, uh, that was part of that as well. And so I, um, uh, I started to drink and use, and it became a big problem in my life. I mean, uh, in, uh, the first, well, I was, I was starting to like, try to get high in, uh, at least seventh grade, sixth grade. Um, but I never really, you know, the, the weed that we were getting, it was like 
horrible and uh, not very potent. And so it wasn't until like uh, I was a freshman in high school that I got high for the first time. And and then it was like daily use of marijuana and drinking on the weekends and sometimes during the week. And there was a lot of conflict in my family about that. It was really stressful for my parents. Of course, my parents, you know, drank and uh, my father had a, I would say, a drinking problem. Uh, my mother was, I would say, dependent on you know, having some wine at the end of the night. I didn't, I don't, I think she sort of drinks. A lot of people would consider it sort of normal, uh, maybe a glass and a half of wine a night. Um, but she was also taking, you know, she suffered from depression and she was taking medication for depression. My dad was, you know, self-medicating with alcohol and, uh, you know, um, even though I wouldn't, maybe use the word alcoholic, uh, I would say he was a problem drinker. And so anyway, that uh, was an influence, I think. And, and, and also just culturally, I think, you know, in, in our culture, you just, the advertising all over the place, it's just like, oh, you know, it's Miller time. Uh, it's time to party or, you know, it's a wedding uh, or you're on vacation or, you're going out to dinner or you're having fun with friends or it's a birthday or, uh, or life is hard. You see it in the movies. Oh, someone's having a hard time. They take a shot of something. So there's a lot in our culture that romanticizes, uh, you know, um, certainly alcohol and also now, uh, you know, uh, cannabis and a lot of other, things and and so you know growing up in growing up in the uh 80s too cocaine was kind of a popular drug in some circles certainly in the circles i was running with and so you know um experimented with a lot of stuff but uh alcohol cannabis and cocaine were like really prominent um in my uh uh life and uh as i say it became a, a huge problem uh i mean i was able to function reasonably well somewhat well maybe maybe that's a better way to put it <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh i was not firing on all cylinders and there was a lot of uh, shame around that i i and and i knew i had a problem and i would sort of struggle with this like on the wagon, off the wagon, sober, then going back. Uh, and, um, you know, through high school, through college, uh, uh, and after college, and in my 20s, it was really bad. And then at the age of 30, uh, kind of had a, a one of a series of wake up calls. There was a lot of them along the road, but. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, uh, Jen, who's still a dear friend, but uh, she said at the age of 30, she was like, okay, you've either got to quit or uh, I'm leaving you. And so uh, I got sober that time for about a year. And that's when I started meditating. I was just like, okay, I need something. I, I'm, I, what do you do? Life is so hard. It's so stressful. You know, and and after a long day at work, five five p.m., I've been working like a dog. And then, what do you do with yourself? I'm stressed. I'm tired. What do you do for fun? I couldn't imagine. What do you do for fun if you don't drink or use? When you go on vacation or you go to a party or you, how's it possible to to have fun without alcohol and drugs? So I, um, but I'd heard uh, earlier in college that. Uh, I had a roommate who practiced uh, transcendental meditation and he said he spoke really highly of it. And I thought, Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try that. And, um, and sure enough, it, it, uh, it worked to, to some extent. It was, it was relaxing. Um, and I felt 
more peaceful after just like the first time of doing it. And I um, did that for about 11 years and it was, it was helpful uh, as a, as a relaxation technique. And I was kind of up and down, uh, you know, on the wagon, off the wagon for that, during that, those 11 years. And then um, at the age of 41, um, I had another sort of uh, breakthrough, I guess, which is, is that I, uh, after, you know, one, you know, sort of bender, uh, I was just, my level of desperation increased and I was just like, okay, what am I going to do? I mean, I'm either going to have to go in rehab or I'm going to have to, you know, really devote myself to Alcoholics Anonymous, which I experimented with. It was helpful. It's a good program, but it, I just didn't feel like it was right for me. And so then I thought, okay, you know what? I think I'm going to take one last stab at this and I'm going to really devote myself to meditation. So I increased, you know, in transcendental meditation, you do 20 minutes a day, twice a day. And so I said, well, I'm going to do, um, you know, an hour and a half, I think is what I said. That's my, that's my 12 step program. And so, and then I, and I went to a, a song I'd never been to before called the Olive Branch song. It doesn't, um, exist anymore but uh shoshin and kaishin um ran that sangha and um and and when i went there um and i kind of shared why i was there um uh kaishin uh kindly shared a cd of of shins and young's called where the path leads and he talks a lot about how uh, about addiction and how you know this the the problem really isn't that you're physiologically addicted to these um, substances it's that you're you're self-medicating it's the suffering that's the root cause of this that's driving the addiction and so at least uh, for for many i mean there may be some physical uh addiction you know to alcohol or you know certain substances um but for me for many and for me that that wasn't the case so much as it was the the root cause was was the uh was the the suffering and and trying to use these substances to alleviate that so that had a big impact on me and i started studying um with shinzen young i started to do retreats um and you know of like a week or two weeks and um and 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 i adopted a new form of meditation uh, the what he's calling now unified mindfulness which which really took my practice to a way different level i mean because transcendental meditation nothing against it it's 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 okay but it's sort of a one trick pony in my view uh it's it's a good relaxation technique and certainly you can develop uh, certain qualities of concentration and and equanimity uh, through that practice but it didn't have all the tools in the toolbox that um shinzen system did and um and and actually and then you could say and buddhism too that that sort of that uh what i consider sort of like the um operator's manual for the mind and the heart and the emotions and the body it's so complex all those systems and and so uh, the this unified mindfulness system was so, so rich and had so many um, options that are you know and what I find is that different techniques are helpful in different situations and at different times, and so having that at my disposal really was uh, took my life to a different level. I mean, it really saved my ass, and I I feel like um, and and even though I was still struggling with the substance abuse uh, for a little while after that, I got sober at the age of 44. And I really credit, you know, uh, sort of um, this Vipassana insight meditation and, and the Brahma Viharas uh, 
uh, and and you could say unified mindfulness maybe um, as the the probably the most important element of my recovery. And I would say that it was probably because um, I it made me mindful of sort of uh, how terrible I felt when I was um, uh, drinking and using. And, and, you know, they, in AA, they talk about how um, the, the river of denial and how uh, like there's the Nile and then there's denial and, and how you're in denial a lot. Uh, and I was in denial a lot. Like I, I, I would have fun partying and then when I felt shitty afterwards hung over or shame or remorse, terrible physically, mentally, like I would uh, try to avoid looking at that, try to escape it. And often that was through drinking and using more. And so uh, finally that, that, that just, I realized it, it just didn't work anymore. And I think, just being able to see that more clearly uh, was the most important element of my of my recovery. Um, there's lots of variables, so it's hard to say. Some of it might have been just natural maturation, and it was as I got older, it was harder and harder on the body. But I still credit, you know, unified mindfulness with kind of being the most important element of my recovery. So anyway, that was a huge game changer because once I got sober, then I could really live life to the fullest. I could fire on all cylinders. Shortly after that, I heard about Soryu uh, For All. Um, uh, I, I met him at a, at a Shinzen Young retreat and, I, and then Shinzen mentioned that he was doing this mind and music program teaching uh, meditation to youth through music. And I thought that oh, was just a brilliant idea. I got really excited. I said, this is what I want to devote my life to. I wish I'd known, you know, meditation, mindfulness, compassion practices when I was younger. Maybe I could have avoided all the trouble that I went through. It certainly, I don't know if I could have. There might have been some, you know, wild aspect in my you know, karma or my mind that wanted to, that just had to go through that. But I think it really could have helped. And who knows, maybe a guy could have avoided that altogether, all that addiction problems altogether. So, um, so then I started getting interested in teaching mindfulness to youth um, through music. And, and actually I took a bunch of trainings from other uh systems on how to teach mindfulness to youth, mindfulness-based stress reduction, all kinds of things, just to see how, how are people doing it? How do you teach mindfulness to youth? Because I could, I could, I, I knew that you, you couldn't do it exactly how you do it with an adult. Um, you you got to change it up and be creative and, and adapt uh, to, you know, what's age appropriate. So um, anyway, I got interested in that and uh, and then really, um, that's been a big focus of my life since then, um, is, is learning how to do that and training how to do that. So developing my own personal practice to be able to do that better, deepening that practice through training it, you know, as you, together with you, uh, and others at Maple, at Oak, um, monastic academy for the preservation of life on earth and and training with um soryu and shinzen and and george haas and many other teachers and um and then and learning how to uh do this uh uh with with youth in the in the schools and so uh i got somewhere along the line i was got my master's in clinical psychology to kind of help with that effort of being in the schools and lend some credibility maybe to this movement to uh, teach mindfulness in the schools, compassion in the schools, meditation in the schools. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, um, and then a few years ago, I started to work uh, locally with a group um 
that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Radley Weininger, and um, kind of, she has a wide network of people and she brought a bunch of people together who were interested in teaching mindfulness in the schools. And we started the Kind Mind program uh, and my partner, business partner, colleague in that um, Vivian Valentine has been, you know, like hugely um, important in that effort. She's really been, you know, maybe sacrificed uh, more than anyone else in terms of um, keeping that program going and doing the dirty work of administration and executive director functions that um, uh, uh, no no one else has been willing to do to that to that extent. So uh, anyway, um, we've been we started about you know f we're going into our fifth year. So May of 2018 is really really when that program started just as a pilot in um, some high schools and then went into the junior highs a little bit. Uh, but we've been um, mostly we've had a greater footprint in the uh, the uh, schools, uh, the uh, K through six. And so we started at one school um, that was uh, mostly, well, 99 percent Latinx population. And then from there, the next year, we we found ourselves in another school, a um, uh, bit of a different dem demographic, uh, but, you know, kind of uh, uh, Caucasian and, and Latinx mix. And then um, uh, uh, then we uh, expanded in that second school. And um, this year things are a little bit different because uh the one school that we were at uh the latinx school that we started in uh they were um well they got a new principal and so uh she's not quite sold on uh mindfulness for her school yet she's still new there and kind of probably trying to figure things out and um so we're not in that school this year um and maybe we'll get into some more of that later. Uh, but that kind of brings us to the present moment, except I'll maybe just say like practicing love and kindness. I was doing that this morning. I was feeling a little bit nervous about this interview because, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to record it and we're going to share it with other people. And so I was like feeling a little self-conscious. And so uh, practice some love and kindness towards myself this morning. It really helped me, you know, like, uh, feel more accepting of myself, less self-conscious, uh, less worried. Um, and then, of course, you had some very kind words to say to me uh, over the text. So that brings us to the present moment. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing your story. It's it's really lovely to hear. And I've heard pieces of that before, of course, but, um, you know, from knowing you for so many years, but it's really lovely to hear it all together and also to share that with the world. And I'm really struck as well by how many of the elements you talked about uh, have analogs in my own life. And, you know, we've talked about that as well, but I feel like there's such a kinship there of like the um, sort of puzzle pieces that fit together to make, you know, I think this practice and loving kindness in particular in the Brahma Vihara is so compelling and, um, you know, Shinzen system. I mean, you know, he was such a big role in my own path and stuff as well. So um yeah, so I have a few questions about that. Like, first, I'd be curious to hear what it was about Alcoholics Anonymous that felt like it it didn't quite work for you or wasn't quite the right fit for you personally. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I don't know if I can articulate it. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, it maybe... Maybe because it, 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 there were some groups that did meditation. Um, you there there were like a couple in town that did meditation, and so I would go to those, and they would like, um, they meditate for I don't know five minutes or so. It was like pretty short, um, and so I think maybe there was a part of me that just deep down it. I didn't 
know it at the time, but like that that somehow meditation and and uh and the the uh vipassana meditation and the and the brahma viharas uh there it didn't have that kind of sort of um that psychoeducational uh aspect of of understanding my own mind and uh it, certainly it it can lead to a lot of insights and 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 understanding your mind and and your behaviors for some people but but it was missing the the buddhist element you could say uh and and so um i think that might have had something to do with it is that that without really knowing what i was missing i i was just still looking for you know what 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 i thought was was going to help me and and um and so uh you know that that was part of it i think and i who knows maybe there was some resistance to just like calling myself an alcoholic and going to the meetings uh i mean i don't mind going to meditation meetings but i i don't know i it's hard for me to articulate that's the best mm -hmm. i can really do yeah i seem to remember you saying something to the effect of and this is from both from my memory and yeah. you know you'll have to see what you think now but uh something about how you didn't really resonate with continuing to describe yourself as an al alcoholic or an addict that for you, it's like, no, I am sober and I have sort of solved that problem and worked that out. And I'm not like still an alcoholic or not still an addict. Uh, am, am I recalling that correctly or would you qualify that in any way? Yeah, you are recalling that correctly. And thanks for reminding me of that because I do think there was some element of that. And actually when I, um, I, I consider myself sober since Father's Day of 2010. Now, um, uh, for about seven years after that, I would actually, I I would occasionally, every few weeks, have a little bit to drink after that. Like um, half a beer or half a glass of wine with food and over a long period of time so that, that I wasn't intoxicated or inebriated. And when I, uh, and so... And then actually, if I ever sort of felt the slightest little buzz, like I would immediately stop. And there was just like a handful of occasions where I even got that far. Uh, and and then, and I, and I found actually I didn't like it anymore. It was like, um, not only was I mindful of all the downsides and why I didn't want to drink and just like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to sleep. And then I, I'm going to feel terrible in the morning. And, and so I started to associate drinking with all of those negative effects. But then also, too, I found that uh, actually even the things that I used to think were positive or enjoyable, like that buzz, uh, didn't I didn't like that anymore. It was like I really enjoyed the, the clarity uh, of mind and body. Uh, and I didn't want to do anything to mess that up. Uh, but I would I would occasionally uh, drink a little something um, just sort of for a gastronomic experience, like the sensual pleasure of just how it tasted when paired with food and stuff like that. And then eventually, uh, when we took our, our when we took our lay vows, you know, where you um, uh, say that you're. You know, you vow to um, uh, refrain from taking intoxicants, which cloud the mind and lead to heedlessness. And so that's really where I stopped drinking entirely. Uh, and um, 
So, yeah, I did. I didn't know what to do with that really because it's like in Alcoholics Anonymous. My understanding is that like once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic, and you're always in danger of falling off the wagon. And who knows? I mean, maybe I, I I remember one guy in the program. He had been sober for 18 years, and he got a back injury. The doctor prescribed some pain meds, and so he started taking the pain meds, and then he he started drinking again and it went down hill very fast to the point where within, I got the impression within a few weeks or so he was like in passing out in, in the gutter in a, in a public park or whatever. So who knows that, that kind of thing could happen, but I guess I just, the way I feel now, it's just like, I, I don't feel that, that that's in danger of, I that, that that's, gonna happen for me um and i sort of do feel like i'm cured i guess to some extent maybe that's delusion maybe we'll feel find that out <laughs> some point in the future if i get a back injury and the pain is horrible i i don't know but uh anyway yeah that that is true that 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 i, I had a hard time sort of feeling like i fit in exactly and and since that point in time i've read some articles like in the I remember there was an article in the LA times about how, you know, the path to recovery is different for so many people. And sometimes I feel like the, the AA model sort of sees it kind of more black and white. And, and this article, in the LA times talked about how, you know, there's people who have drinking problems and then they recover from them and, uh, and, and they, um, they still drink and they drink normally or, you know, and we can talk about, we can consider whether, you know, normal drinking quote unquote is still sort of a, a dependence on a intoxicant to deal with suffering. Uh, but um, uh, in any event, yeah, I, I, that did have, that did play a part in that, in, in that, uh decision not to go down the the aa path path mm -hmm. for for myself and as i say i have a lot of respect for that program um actually i have one friend who he was my sponsor for a little while in that program and now he's uh we're we're friends now uh we didn't see each other for a long time we're friends now he drinks a little bit every once in a while um and it seems to be for the most part super under control i remember one time he he shared with me okay there was i think i had three drinks last night and i felt bad about that i don't want to do that again but that was so i i don't know that 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 article in the la times suggested that there's a, a broad spectrum of how people um uh recover from alcohol and substance abuse and so um it's not quite as black and white as some people are quote unquote alcoholic. Some people aren't. Um, and maybe Al Alcoholics Anonymous recognizes that. And, and so I'm not an alcoholic or I, I yeah, I don't know, but mm. yeah. And when you started doing what's now called unified mindfulness, what were the actual techniques you were practicing at the time? Yeah, it, it was. And at the time that was called basic mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the name's been changed, but like I, the ones that I really gravitated to first were like, I would, um, so at the end of the day, I just felt like I needed a reward for making it through the day, a hard day of work. It's 5 PM. And now I'm going to, I, I, I want to do something that's going to bring me happiness and joy and um so i would go to some place in nature it would be a, a park the beach some place like that i would sit down and i would do some um usually i think i would do some focus on breath so just to relax um but also like see, uh, see out just enjoy the beauty of nature that was enjoyable for me that was a reward uh, a substitute for uh, alcohol and cannabis, you know, and, 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 and hear out, enjoy the, 
beautiful sounds of nature and 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 then feel out and feel rest feeling feeling this relaxation in the body or the sensations of the body as i would go for a walk on the beach um so those were those were like a lot of the practices that i was doing initially um i don't even know how much i was practicing the brahma viharas um uh, metta practice uh and initially uh, i don't think that much uh and you know shinzen it's part of his system but he doesn't really emphasize it as much as um uh maybe the vipassana uh uh elements of his practice and so um so anyway that was those were the main techniques and then also uh I found feel in to be really helpful, feel flow. Like I remember um, sometimes if I was in a, a, you know, a conflict with someone, um, I remember one time getting in a, a conflict with, with Sori when we were working together and, uh, and going to a park bench and like, and, and just feeling flow, feeling the, the, uh, flow of strong emotions in my body uh, and um uh and, and as as shinzen put it, it like a massage so it's paradoxically it could actually be pleasant if you sort of didn't focus on the rumination of oh that jerk he said this that pissed me off uh, he's wrong about that or whatever just like feeling the uh, sensations in the body of strong emotions uh like lava coming up into the inner part of the chest from the belly and you know in the hands and in the arms and legs feet you know face uh, and, and so that sometimes was a helpful technique. And there's other times when like, I'd feel shame if I made a mistake and I just feel the shame arising in my body. And that could be really like liberating, really fun and interesting paradoxically. Cause it was just like a massage of energy in my body. If I just focused on those sensations. So those are the main ones that I was doing. And then, uh, I started to practice the Brahma Vihara as a, uh, more uh, prominently in my practice uh, a bit later. Hmm. Hmm. I want to ask you about that, of course, but um, I'm curious to ask first, uh, you mentioned that, you know, when you first started trying to get sober, that you couldn't even imagine what you could do that was fun if you weren't drinking or using. And I wonder what you would tell your past self about how you understand fun now and what fun is and how to have fun without drinking or using. Oh yeah. Great question. So, you know, I guess I'd say I'm just imagining myself like talking to myself at that age, you know, I'm getting emotional because it's so painful for so long. You know, that was, I tell people that that was the hardest problem I ever dealt with in my life. Me being at my mom's deathbed was hard. My dad's death was hard. My relationship with my brother is complicated, but that was because it just lasted for so long. Decades so painful and uh so i would say that first of all i just i love you and i care about you and i, I know I, I know life is hard life is hard and uh, it's 
It's hard to imagine not being able to drink, smoke, use. Uh, and I can just tell you, having been through what I've been through and been there for so long, is that give it a chance it's 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 way better than you imagine it's it's going to be hard at first yes of course because it's it's going to take some time to get used to this new way of life this new way of thinking uh but don't but also be be mindful of like the the problems, the downsides of it. You know, we tend to romanticize the the good parts of it, and then deny and stuff and push away and repress and suppress the downside of it. And uh, so, uh, so take a look at that and. Uh, and and give sobriety a chance and 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 i'll often tell other people who are struggling with this problem and i tell myself too that like find ha have fun as much as possible in sober ways so you know maybe it's listening to music or maybe it's going into nature maybe it's doing a, a meditation technique here or there or be with friends uh go to comedy do whatever because you need to persuade yourself that you are uh that that life is worth living and life is fun and rewarding and fulfilling without alcohol without drugs and uh so, and, and, uh, and give it a chance and, 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 and if you can, and anything you can do to there. And also I'll say that these, these temptations that we have sometimes, you know, they're, they don't last forever. And I think that was one of the hard things for me. And maybe, maybe, uh, one of the helpful things about Vipassana meditation is like focusing on gone, focusing on, uh, that, that the impermanence of, of phenomena. Whereas when I was drinking and using, it was like, if I felt terrible, I just, it, at that moment, it feels like it's going to last forever. Like I didn't have a very good ability to, to like, uh, just be with that difficulty with that difficult emotion and, and ride it out till you get to the other side where it goes away it's fades and you're 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 at peace again you're happy again you're relaxed again whatever it is and so i would say yeah if there's any whatever you can do to uh to get through those tough times and that's why i mean aa has some really good you know suggestions like you can call someone up if you can call someone up and they can be sort of this person that you can rely on to to just get you through that that tough moment or period of time whatever it is maybe it's uh, a few minutes or a few hours or a day uh that if you can get through that um it this this difficulty will end and you will and then when you wake up in the morning, I, I'll, I'd say that too. Notice that, like you get up in the morning and you're not hung over, no, no headache, no blah, no low energy, feeling terrible in the body or negative thoughts about, oh shit, I did this to myself again. I can't believe it. Oh, I feel so terrible. I feel ashamed. I feel remorse. Why did I do that? damn it, I feel terrible now. And uh, 
how am I going to feel better? And often it'd be like, oh, just, okay, make it to happy hour. And then at happy hour, hair of the dog, go to your favorite bar, have some drinks. You'll feel better. No, it's just a terrible, vicious cycle. So uh, notice how good you feel in the morning when you wake up full of energy, full of vim and vigor, bright eyed and bushy tail. You know, just clear mind, clear body, healthy body. No problems. Well, you know, none of the problems that you have with with uh, abusing these substances you may have other issues, of course, but uh, at least those pernicious problems that you deal with when you're struggling with alcohol or drug abuses. You don't have those to deal with on top of everything else. Mm. Mm, thank you for sharing that, Harrison. It's really beautiful to hear and um, sort of on the one hand, feeling into what it might mean for your past self to hear those words and how much courage that might have given him if he'd heard from you. And I uh, would hope that those words might touch someone who needs them now and in the future yeah yeah thank you for for saying that that is one thing that inspires me to teach mindfulness meditation brahma viharas to kids and adults is you know that uh maybe people who are at risk of these this this particular issue uh can avoid it or overcome it um, through these practices and in the way that i did and hopefully offer them some hope and mm. and the and the tools to to do it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a great kindness mm. do you remember what it was like for you to start practicing loving kindness and the Brahma Viharas and sort of what that brought, what brought that about for you? Yes. Now, um, can, can I mute myself and blow my nose? I, I got oh, a course. little bit teary eyed. And so, uh, just one of course, more. friend. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay, so uh, can you ask that question again? Of course. Um, I'm curious about when you started practicing loving kindness and the Brahma Viharas and what brought that about. Yeah, uh, so one way to look at that is that, uh, you know, I started practicing the Brahma Viharas before I really knew what Brahma Viharas was. And, um, you know, uh, in part from uh, the, let's say, just uh, naturally loving people. And then also through, you know, learning about uh, uh, Jesus's message of love and, and, uh, you know, the example my parents set, you know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of influential people in my life and they're maybe the most influential just by virtue of the huge role that they played in my upbringing. And they valued the role of love and forgiveness and, you know, and, and, and they subscribe to those values, uh, going to church, um, bringing me to church, encouraging me, uh, to, I got, uh, confirmed uh as a teen and so uh we would pray at night and you know uh and and i think that their lives and uh were directed uh you know 
uh, through that prism of 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 uh, Christ's message and um, love. So, uh, and then you know the, all the other incredible examples of loving people in the world, and you know then you start to learn about uh, other you know modern day saints you know who who love uh you know desmond tutu and uh later on peace pilgrim and you know the buddha and uh and um so uh so there's those kinds of sort of informal ways of learning about the brahma viharas and then um And then formally through this meditation practice and kind of, uh, well, it, at some point, and I think it was around sort of uh, the end of my, end of high school, I sort of stopped being interested in organized religion. I was kind of like, uh I, you know i was partying and and you know it was like i don't know i was agnostic uh and and then um when i started to study with shinzen young i started to really get into buddhism and uh had a uh let's say a renewed appreciation for the spiritual practices uh and uh and then um and so i started to learn how to practice loving kindness meditation i think uh at at a shinzen young retreat and um and so i did that uh, uh to some extent and then um uh, and and I found that yeah, even a little bit could go a long way too. Uh, that sometimes it just had a nice. It was, I was happy that the unified mindfulness system had so many options, and so there were times when you know some kind of a vipassana technique just wouldn't this wouldn't work, and then like a meta loving kindness practice would just suddenly just hit the spot. <laughs> Sometimes just even a little bit would just go a long way. <laughs> um, but I uh, started to learn how I could uh, do that uh, more. And um, so then, um, so that was, you could say a kind of a, a leap forward in my practice of, of uh, Brahma Viharas and um then um uh, uh when i started to I'm trying to think um well i think when i started studying with with george haas too it took another leap forward um because he you know he emphasizes it more he has this great you know program uh where you know, five days a week from 7.30 to about 7.55 or 8. Uh, you know, you can practice daily with him. And um, he alternates between, you know, like one day of Vipassana practice and one day of, of loving kindness practice of some sort, Brahma Vihara practice. Um, and uh, I'm saying that right uh, correctly right brahma viharas is the mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. four uh loving mm -hmm. kindness uh techniques so he he goes through all of those different ones um kind of cycles through them and um so i could see how you could you could emphasize those a lot more and uh and then uh he went on uh he took some of his students to Burma, uh, to Myanmar, to see, uh, to do a loving kindness 
um, retreat and do a little spiritual tur tourism before and after the retreat. And, uh, and so uh, that was the first retreat I went to in um, Myanmar, where it was like, where for that first retreat, retreat, I think it was two weeks. Uh, it, it was like 100% uh, meta. Uh, that was the only technique you would practice in, unless you were like super emotionally dysregulated where you had to do something else. But I don't, I never really got to that point. So for 24 seven, for two weeks, just doing a, a loving kindness meditation. And I was really surprised that you could like do an entire retreat just devoted to that one technique because uh previously you know shinzen's you know there's pros and cons to everything and as shinzen will say and so his retreats you do some loving kindness meditation you do some other stuff and that was all really fun really helpful i mean i'm so grateful for shinzen's methodology of of teaching meditation it's hugely influential in my life uh and you know you could maybe say still the my go-to you know uh way of practicing um because i i have all these different options that i do at various times but uh but then studying with george haas and um and and then also with say uh say it indica in uh myanmar and 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 then also he had two nuns helping well actually one was a nun one was a disrobe but uh uh there was um uh What's her name? Oh, Venerable Viranyani and Aria. Uh, and so um, uh, I um, saw how you could really like go way deeper into this, this practice of loving kindness. Um, and then um, the next year I went back and I like did a temporary ordination where I was a monk for a... <laughs> a month which was fun and also a little bit weird because then um like uh viranyani and aria would like have to bow to me because because mm. in myanmar uh it's like the monks are a little bit at a considered because they're men um they're higher on the totem pole and so that that felt a little bit, that was definitely weird for me. Cause I, I bow to them, um, you know, they're my teachers and I have a, so much respect for them. Um, and, uh, but, uh, anyway, that, uh, doing it for a month, doing loving kindness for a month, solid, uh, really just like was life changing too. Just like, wow, you can, um, you can do this as, as just this technique for a month. And um, so uh, that my, my practice of loving kindness took another leap forward, you know, in those retreats. And um, so I try to keep a healthy dose of, of loving kindness um, going uh, these days. And um Try not to neglect that uh, aspect of my practice. And of course, you know, you, you inspire me, my friend. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way that you, so beautiful, mm -hmm. how you manifest loving kindness in this very unique, creative way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we trained together and you, you did some hardcore training at, you know, uh, Oak and maple and then now you're sort of this uh itinerant wandering quasi monk out there uh and and you know you have these like videos and these interviews and uh um how you comport yourself and your dedication to this practice just like still wear your sash and you like uh and how you manifest love and kindness um how de devoted you are to it uh through different artistic pursuits and um it's like 
super cool. So, so mm. you inspire me. And then of course, you know, there's a, the examples of Jesus and Buddha and, um, uh, so I kind of forget, uh, what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> you answered several of them. Thank you. Uh, uh, and thank you for your kind words as well. I think, um, one of the things that's really struck me as I've begun sort of sharing this technique with the world is how much, if somebody, if it really lights a fire in someone's life, like, yeah. you know, it, it, I think it impacts people without fail if they try the technique like in the moment, but some people just like, you know, it explodes in them. And um, when that happens, it really seems to manifest in a way that's particular to their personality and yeah. they, they bring forth, I mean, you know, meta of course is unconditional love for all beings. And um, you know, it's, it's this pure form of love and everyone that practices it learns to taste that. But at the same time, there's something very, particular about each person and the way they bring that forth and the way they practice it and the way they manifest it in their life and i've i've really come to like appreciate that and and watch for it and notice it and really and learn from it like oh i didn't know you could practice love in that way like there are so many ways to love and i learned from each person and that practices it. it's like oh you can love that way too wow there's you know that flavor of love and that expression of love and um you know certainly uh, how to put this. I mean, I, I really learned that from you and that's why I took it up was seeing your example and was such a, I mean, I literally started practicing Metta because of you and the way you manifested it. And that's, that's in me. And then, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me that, um, you know, it would take a certain form with my personality and that, that it would each person we, we would sort of learn from and be inspired by. And, and I watch for that. I, I feel like such a student of it still, because there's so much to learn of, the many ways you can express love and feel love and, and share that in the world. And um, it's, it's sort of um, humbling and delightful to be like, there's just so many, so many ways to love. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's wonderful. It's like amazing. I, and I want to mention too, I didn't, I don't know if I mentioned George Haas, but he's been mm -hmm. hugely influential yes. and, and uh, say it out uh, Indica. And, um, and then of course, like peace pilgrim and, yes. Um, you know, and so are you and, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's so many different people and, and even, you know, people who aren't Buddhist or have no spiritual affiliation um, with any uh, tradition per se, as you say, it's just like, you start to see how uh people manifest this quality of love in so many different ways and it's it's mm. it's beautiful and it's fun and it's mm. interesting and it's inspiring to see mm. just how what a incredible kaleidoscope of mm. different ways there are to to express it and to practice it mm. Mm, i love that image i wonder um was there anything that the time that you're practicing with Sayada U Indika and you're in Myanmar and uh, Burma, and was there anything that was sort of like an instruction that you were given or a way that the teaching was shared that uh, was uh, surprising for you or was particularly helpful or uh, anything like that? Um, let's see. Let's see. Surprising. You know, over there in Burma, they're kind of they they are uh, kind of traditional, right? So they've got their phrases, and then um, and you know, may you be well, happy, and peaceful, or may you be peaceful, or things like that. And you know, they they were kind of a little bit they weren't. You know, like if you started to get real creative with your phrases and use different uh, and and wander too far off of those examples, it was like they kind of were more traditional, you know, and mm -hmm. they were like, well, you know, uh, they they might not uh, a little bit creativity was OK, but like they might not. uh 
uh, be super they they might not suggest like uh diverging too radically um in your phraseology of those loving kindness uh techniques um and uh and 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 so when i'm you know practicing with them and training with them i do it their way and then i think when i uh but i have little bit more flexibility and creativity with the phrases that I use. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I, I love those traditional phrases and I use them a lot. And there's other times when I have my own phrases that um, are a little bit diverge from the traditional ones that I also find are really helpful. Um, and uh, so I, I like, I, I like, customizing phrases uh something that really resonates with people i think is a good thing uh and so for some person you know maybe there's a certain phrase that just carries a lot of juice for them uh and resonates with them and so i don't want to dissuade them from um uh using a phrase like that um Let's see. Uh, what was the question again? Because uh, it was a rich question. There's like a lot of thoughts I had about it. Well, I'm just curious about your time of, with Sayada Uintika in, in yeah. Myanmar and what uh, the practice was like there, sort of from a talking shop perspective of like yeah. how to how to practice metta and the Brahmi Viharas, anything from that yeah. time that you think might be useful to share? I mean, they were, you know, uh, so the way they did it was like you would start with um yourself which uh, over there is considered like the easiest person to start with mm -hmm. uh but um it's not always the easiest for everybody maybe it's a western culture type of thing i i don't know but uh they would start with uh, yourself loving kindness towards yourself and then um and they'd also pretty early on teach you this technique of uh, like um, all beings, really saying love and kindness towards all beings. And those, uh, as I mentioned, those phrases are, are pretty simple. You know, may you be well, happy and peaceful. May all beings be well, happy and peaceful. Or maybe may you be peaceful. Just just that. And um and then, so you do that for a few days in the retreat, and then um, you'd move on to the next most challenging figure, which would be like a dear person, someone, maybe it's a a, a, um, a mentor, but they, they were supposed to be alive, right? Uh, living, because once someone uh, passes away, supposedly the their you know, uh, there's no, you know, kind of more fixed object where you can like, where that love and kindness can actually go. So you can't get into jhana, uh, love and kindness, jhana, metta jhana. Um, now the, the um, Viranyani and Ariya, they weren't so into getting into jhana, but the Sayada was more into, into jhana. Um, and so, um, uh, Anyway, they recommended using living beings. Uh, and generally, I think they recommended using like uh, people, but um, I don't know. I, it seems like animals or plants are okay. I have a, I have a student who who's he's really into his plants. So he does loving kindness towards his plants. And mm. I, I think that's awesome, actually. <laughs> Me too. Doing loving kindness towards plants uh but you know traditionally you're so you're working through these and not, nothing against the traditional ways of practice too i think it's it's good to have these traditional ways of doing it and i think there's also value in sort of uh at a, i mean the the whole history of buddhism is is uh full of examples where you know there's these adaptations and uh evolutions that are end up being really beautiful, helpful. 
So, uh, so anyway, then they'll like do, uh, you do a few days where then you'd, you'd, you could toggle between like yourself, all beings, and then a dear person, uh, maybe a coach, a mentor, a teacher, a, a, a parent, you know, someone who is just the easiest person for you to feel loving kindness towards. Um, and then uh, after that, it'd be like, after a couple of days of that, then you might move on to the next most challenging being, uh, which would be uh, like, it might, I think it might be like a dear person, but like not quite like a revered person. This is this revered person. And then there's maybe like a dear person. Maybe it's like a friend where you maybe have, uh, there's still, there's a little bit more tension in the relationship, a little bit more friction because for whatever reason, right? Uh, when we have these real life relationships with people, sometimes there's, you know, things that crop up that maybe for a revered person doesn't, you know, maybe the revered person, like it might be the Dalai Lama or something like that, where you kind of have this idealized version of them or something. Um, so then there's, then there's the dear person. Um, then there's neutral. So then you move on to neutral people. So it's very method, methodical. Uh, and then um, uh, after a couple of days, you're, you're now sort of, you change it up. It's not, you do like, you might do yourself. You might do um, all beings. And then, you know, maybe you do the neutral person mostly for a few days, um, but you're sprinkling in some of these other beings that you've, or categories of beings that you've been practicing towards, you know, and then you go on to, and then after the neutral person, then it's the hardest uh, category of being who, which they call like the enemy, but that's a strong word. And so sometimes I, I, I'll just call it a difficult person. Right. Uh, and, um, and you can start, there's a whole spectrum of difficult people in our lives. And so, you know, generally <laughs> recommended that you start with like, an easy, difficult person uh -huh. <laughs> on a scale of one to 10, they're like a one or a two. Right. Uh -huh. And then you can work up to your arch enemies or people who, and it's recommended that you work up to your arch enemies at some, some point. And maybe initially you can't imagine sending them love and kindness because they've hurt you so badly, but then you hear, you know, inspirational stories of people in Tibet who practice loving kindness <laughs> towards like Chinese captors and, you know, people who have like tortured them, you know, and other pe people in, in uh, Vietnam and in the war who've been tortured. Uh, and, and so it's like inspirational to hear how people can practice loving kindness towards those sorts of people who have just hurt them so badly. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, so you work up to those difficult people and it's okay to set those extremely difficult people aside to say, I'm not ready to forgive those people yet. I'm going to stick. I, I'm, I'm maybe someday, maybe in 20 years. And I heard one teacher say how she had a student who said, maybe in 20 years, I'll be able to practice towards them. And then, by practicing this practice, you know, maybe after a few years, I don't know whether it was three years or five years, they were able to practice towards someone who would deeply, deeply hurt them like that. So hmm. um, anyway, uh, that's when, you, when you're sharing the technique with students or teaching it, uh, is there anything that you like to emphasize that, especially anything that you feel might not be emphasized by other teachers or is something you've discovered for yourself or that's been helpful to you personally. Yeah. And I'm going to look at my notes here a little bit, uh, just to remind myself. Uh, but yeah, I, I like, uh, I suggest starting with easy people. I mean, even that is just, if you're filling your mind with love and kindness and you're not thinking about anything else, then you're 
training the mind to be loving and kind in a very tangible, important, profound way. Uh, and then sometimes uh, I find that like beginners will say, I, uh, and by the way, you had two questions that were, I, I found myself answering them both at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what advice would you give someone starting out with meta practice? And then is there anything unusual or non-obvious you'd like to emphasize when teaching meta and the Brahma Viharas? Mm -hmm. So, so I might just kind of answer both of those at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, but like sometimes beginners will say, like, I don't feel anything. Um, and I can certainly, uh, relate to that too. There's times when I'm trying to practice love and kindness, uh, and, and I'm not, feeling anything or you might feel the opposite coming up uh like i remember one time trying to practice loving kindness towards shins and young one time and like then but all i could think about was like this one time when he pissed me off mm. <laughs> and he said something that kind of made me bad right mm. so but that was just a, an isolated incident you know i mean it was it didn't last for a long time but for that let's say that day or for a few days, it's like, that's what was coming up for me. And so, you know, the, uh, what I, what they suggest at that retreat in Burma, uh, is to, uh, uh, you know, keep at it, you know, um, and you can, you can actually switch to another person if, if for some reason, um, that's not cultivating a, a sense of love and kindness, then, um you, you you don't have to necessarily switch immediately but like if you just find that it's not it's not working uh after some short period of time i mean it's okay to switch to someone who's easy and then you can toggle back and forth between easy and hard but it's not you're not doing anything wrong that's one thing i would say is you're not doing anything wrong if uh you are um if you're not feeling it, if you're feeling neutral or you're feeling the opposite, it's natural. We have these relationships with people that are complex. Sometimes they've said things that have offended us or hurt us. They've done things. It's a natural part of the process. You're not doing it wrong. You just plug away. Um, and, uh, you know, over a lifetime, you know, you develop this capacity for greater loving kindness just like working out, you know, sometimes you don't feel like it or it's hard, uh, you feel weak uh, and and you, you just keep at it. And sometimes there's days you rest. It's like a healthy to rest, you know, uh, from exercise and take an off day or whatever. You have an injury, you got a nurse that you know, nurse yourself back to health. You, so um, that's something I would say. Um, and uh uh, I like uh, customizing phrases. I think I mentioned that first. One thing I'm um, experimenting with is is I uh, is like using first person and second person when doing loving kindness towards myself. Like uh, if I say sometimes I might say, "May I be peaceful?" Right? That's a that's a traditional way of doing it. But then I've also been reading some. Uh, articles about how it can be helpful to speak to yourself in the second person. So uh, I, um, you might say, uh, I might say like, uh, I accept you just the way you are. Friend Harrison or friend Kaishin. It's my Dharma name, right? So sometimes I uh, use Harrison. Sometimes I call myself Kaishin, but I speak to myself and, and I'm, I'm just experimenting with that, you know? And like, I, uh, sometimes speaking to myself on the first person seems, I don't know, carries more juice. Um, sometimes speaking to myself in the second person seems, um, like it's hitting the spot better. So, uh, I, uh, you know, I think experimentation is really uh, beneficial in this practice. Um, that it's we're we have to make it our own, and and so uh, being creative and trying different things and uh, experimenting um, with different phraseologies, uh, 
I think is, uh, I, I like to suggest that to, to students. Um, I, one thing that was blew my mind is that you could do this so much, right? You could, you could do this 24 seven for some period of time. Uh, and so, uh, before I'd kind of thought it was just, I don't know, something you did for a little while, but you could do it for a couple of weeks or, you know, as the Sayada said, a few months. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's times if you do that, there's times when it's just going to be kind of be really boring and, you know, um, and that's okay. Um, sometimes meditation can be boring, but we can switch to, to, you know, we're, we're free to choose if we want to try something that's more fun. And that can be a skillful way to practice too, is like just, uh, you know, when it starts to get old and stale, you, you can switch to something that inspires you and then makes you want to practice. Mm. There's mm. something to be said for that too. You know, as, as Shinzen Young says, you know, there's time to bear down and there's a time to ease up. And sometimes, you know, you need, might be helpful to bear down on one technique, even though it's hard. And another time might be helpful to ease up and do another technique that, it's more fun, inspires you. Um, I'd say like uh, it's okay to do it towards animals and plants and even dead people. You know, uh, the Sayada traditionally in Burma they would say like if you if you if you do it to dead people, there there's no place for your meta to land, so you can't get into jhana. Uh, but uh, sometimes I. Maybe you don't need to always have to be striving for jhana, right? So uh, I like to send loving kindness towards my parents or who've passed away or uh, people who are dead. And, and, you know, there's that book about Peace Pilgrim and how she, uh, you know, when she had that near-death experience and people that, uh, spirits that came to her from the other side and, uh so i don't know i think maybe they're i i'm not gonna say that uh you uh can't that you can get into a uh, jhana by doing it towards uh dead sp or spirits dead people uh because i i haven't tried i guess that hard but and and I don't know that they would say that you can't, you're forbidden from doing it. It's just, they suggest that it's hard, that you can't get into uh, metta jhana because there's no place for that metta to land. Hmm. Um, no living being for that metta to land. So I don't know. I, I like to spread the love around and hmm. I believe there's spirits all over around us that could benefit from some loving kindness. So. Hmm. Um, I like to, uh, sometimes I suggest smiling a little bit that helps me sometimes get into a, a, a feeling of loving kindness or putting a hand on the heart. Hmm. Um, and, uh, I read, I, I heard recently that putting a hand on a heart can release some oxytocin. So hmm. who knows, maybe that you could, uh, experiment with that, but sometimes I like putting a hand on my heart and practicing love and kindness. And I feel like it, it like deepens it a little bit. Hmm. Uh, and I like also uh, mouthing the words or speaking them out loud, uh, those loving kindness phrases. Um, so uh, uh, sometimes that helps me concentrate and focus. Um, I don't, I feel like concentration really isn't my, strongest suit so uh, anything i can use to help me focus uh keep the mind from wandering i'll hmm. use those little tricks of the trade um and i'll just say also maybe this is the last thing but i i feel like loving kindness sometimes it's just like just what the doctor ordered it's like i'm going through a tough time and one technique isn't working and then i'll practice a little loving kindness towards myself or other beings and it can really just have a dramatic effect on how i'm feeling and um so mm -hmm. i think it's a really helpful technique to have in the in the tool belt mm. thank you 
Uh, I think we have time for one more question since I have another commitment today. I wonder yeah. um, if I could ask you, one of the things I've really fallen in love with about this practice is uh, how, in the, the you know, I think it was really Suri that got me on this uh, originally was just seeing spiritual practice in terms of perception and behavior and, uh -huh. uh, you know, feedback loops between them. And it seems to me that you can sort of describe this practice in terms of, well, when, when you're, when you're practicing it, when you're cultivating it, you are cultivating the perception of loving kindness, the feelings of loving kindness and yeah. that state of mind and that way of seeing, yeah. and then that that manifests it, it, you know, it's working if it sort of manifests in action and behaviors that are yeah. expressing that kindness and yeah. uh, the the feelings of love, the the state of mind of love becomes actions of kindness, real behavior that's, you know, uh, demonstrable and manifest. And um, I wonder if there are any, you know, sort of ordinary acts of kindness that you've become fond of over the years of little nice things that you like to do for people and uh, any ways that kindness shows up in your life. Uh, yeah, I, um, uh, I like to, uh, pick up trash on the beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's one way that I manifest loving kindness is, uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, uh, generous kind act that I do for the environment, for the planet, for animals plants, people, my own satisfaction. Uh, and sometimes there's not much trash on the beach. Sometimes there's larger quantities and I'm making several trips over to the uh, trash receptacles, but I, I like to do that. Uh, mm. I like, um, and I like being sort of, uh, I, I like being really friendly with people and like, um, uh, you know, so getting to know, uh, so yeah, friendly with strangers and also friendly with like people I know and getting kind of goofy with them and um, humor, like to use humor a lot as a way of expressing love and kindness um so getting goofy and silly with people is is a fun way uh, uh um and and yeah just being really friendly with people mm -hmm. i like i like doing that and sometimes people you get uh, it, it's fun because there's a positive feedback loop like people will get into being friendly and goofy and loving with you too. And so that can be uh, really fun. Uh, mm. I like doing that. I like, and uh, with the kids, you know, last year I kind of had this unique opportunity. I was uh, a playground advisor. Um, so uh, um, in the school mindfulness program, we do kind, kind mind program. We'll probably, need to change the name because there's a trademark issue that we're uh, bumping up against but um uh for last year i was not only teaching mindfulness in the classrooms and in the schools but then um as a way to kind of deepen uh the uh meditation or sorry the the well in in the schools we call it mindfulness compassion meditation sometimes has a religious connotation for people so we don't use that uh word in um the classrooms because we're, we're it's the, the school program's a secular program uh and so um we had we created a new position called the playground advisor where not where i'd go out and i'd be on the playground with the kids for about three and a half hours a day trying to integrate mindfulness and compassion practices into um everything that they were doing into life so it was like playing with them and um eating you know lunch with them and uh 
and and over time um and, and so that was really fun like just uh just playing with them uh and getting down on their level like i really like to get silly with the little with the little kids i i think sometimes um it's a little disarming for them to see someone of my age get as uh, silly <laughs> as i can get <laughs> and uh, so like i'll play with them i'll play tag with them and uh um they there was this thing last year where they were doing um they would they would say na 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 boo boo na 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 boo boo and they would like tease me like that and then i'd i'd chase them and then uh and uh and they just loved being chased by me mm. and playing that game with me. And uh, and so it was just this great way to just experience like pure joy and love and happiness with them uh, by getting down on their level of of play and fun and silliness. Um, and uh, so that's one way that I like to manifest with the with the kids. And then the older kids wouldn't do that, but like I'd play basketball with them or we'd play tag with them. And even some, even there were some of the older kids who like really weren't into mindfulness. When we go in the classroom, they'd be just like not into it at all. But then and over the course of the year, and I tried to learn every kid's name of uh, 225 names probably. And, you know, over the course of the year, I was finally able to. So I made a point of learning people's names. And that's one way that I manifest uh, mm. loving kindness, too, is just getting to know people's names and and getting to know what they're interested in. So these kids ask them, what what are you interested? In? What, are you, what are you like? And then um, sometimes they're into basketball. So play basketball, talk basketball with them. Sometimes there were some students who just were not into mindfulness uh, in the classroom uh and not really into me but, but uh you know like um if i was but they might play tag with me <laughs> they might play basketball with me and so like that was a way to connect with them and hmm. experience love and kindness towards each other in this in this way hmm. uh, love all of that thank you for telling me the different ways you manifest kindness and of course i know of more knowing you well but it's nice to hear you sharing those and um yeah i just want to close the conversation by thanking you for having it with me and uh really for being my dharma brother and for inspiring me to do this practice and um you know for all of the the, the kind service that you do in the world helping children to learn these practices and it's been very inspiring to me and I wish we had time to talk about that more as well, but, you know, uh, constraints are a thing, but um, I just really thank you for that and also for speaking with me and sharing your heart and your life and your wisdom with us. So thank you for, uh, for all of that, Harrison. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, it was, uh, it was really fun to uh, riff with you on these important, noble topics of mindfulness meditation compassion loving kindness i mean mm -hmm. what could be more important you know and uh i hope we get a chance to um maybe have another conversation we didn't get to a really juicy topic uh mm -hmm. the question you had what have you learned about teaching mm -hmm. mindfulness in schools and that's like a big question and i mm -hmm. i have i i wrote down all these things that i've learned from that that I would love to share, mm -hmm. um, but I understand we don't have time um, now and I don't think we could do it justice uh, by getting into that, but uh, teaching mindfulness to youth and teaching mindfulness in the schools uh, is like a very rich topic. So I hope we have a chance to, uh, to cover that. But in the meantime, it was really um, a pleasure to be on your podcast. You're doing great work. Uh, with all these interviews, I've, I've enjoyed uh, listening to your interviews of other people and, and seeing all the other uh, ways that you creatively manifest uh, loving kindness in the world. Mm. 
Um, so thanks for having this conversation with me and for your podcast and um, sharing these uh, teachings with uh, with the world. It's really beautiful to mm. see you in action. <laughs> well, we're doing it together. So. Yes, we are. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you, friend. Okay, my friend. <laughs>